Okay, the next talk will be Secure Computation on the Web, Computing Without Simultaneous Interaction by Shai Levy, Yuda Lindel, and Benny Pincas, and Yuda will be giving the talk. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk about uh, secure computation on the web or uh, computing without simultaneous interaction. And I'll start with my standard first slide for secure computation. Unlike my predecessors, there's no cloud on it. But basically what uh, we talk about is a set of parties with private inputs and they want to carry out some joint computation without uh, revealing their inputs. They want to guarantee correctness. They want to guarantee independence of inputs and other properties. And these properties have to be ensured even if some of the parties involved attack maliciously or in some other way semi-honestly the protocol that's going on. And what we say, and this is what I want to focus on, is what we like to say is that this models any problem, essentially uh, elections or auctions, private statistical analysis and so on. So if it's a, an election we're talking about, then privacy means that my individual input won't be, my, my vote won't be learned. Uh, the uh, correctness says that the, cr the candidate who gets the most uh, amount of votes will be the one that actually wins, and so on and so forth. The question that we address in this paper is uh, really whether secure computation does actually model these problems that we're trying to solve. So the real world uh, problem of online elections, auctions, st st uh, statistical analysis of distributed parties' data, for example, a website wants to uh, uh, carry out some statistical computation uh, aggregation about the uh, parties who visit the website. Does secure computation really model these problems? And I'm not talking about the problem of efficiency. So assuming that we can do things really, really efficiently, uh, there's still a question as to actually whether we can solve these problems. And the reason is that in all known protocols for secure computation, all the parties interact simultaneously. So everybody has to come together and give their inputs at the same time. Now let's analyze some of these problems that we're talking about. Let's take a simple problem with a closed group of parties. Everyone knows who's there, it's not too many. We just want to carry out a vote for a faculty member's tenure. That's all we want to do. Since there's a lot of politics in our department, we want to make sure this is a secure protocol. And the problem is that if anybody's ever tried to schedule three faculty members in a meeting, you'll know that it takes about two months. So getting 40 faculty members or however many you have in your department together at the same time, even to go online at the same time when half of them are overseas or at different conferences, is actually a very, very big problem in practice if you want to run such a protocol. You need everyone to get online at the same time, and that's hard to do. It, it gets even worse if you want to talk about this application of a website that wants to uh, somehow I don't know, compute demographics, statistics of demographics of the p parties who are coming to visit the website because each party comes, does whatever it does and goes. It's not going to hang around till another 5,000 parties get together and then run some joint protocol with parties that it has nothing to do with anyway. So this actually becomes a very, very big problem. Stated differently, this is the model that we're used to with secure computation. It doesn't have to be synchronous, but everyone's there and everyone's computing. However, the real world model is more like this. A party comes, does some computation and goes. A couple come, they go away. The only uh, stable member here is the web server. Everyone else just comes and goes. And we want to somehow see if we can do secure computation in this sort of model as well. And the question is, can we make secure computation non-simultaneous? So can the parties come along and just visit once and go away and actually compute securely on their inputs? And this actually, uh, is an important theoretical question. It, bring, it gives, deepens our understanding of what communication is necessary for secure computation, for secure, secure protocols, which is really a very, very uh, important uh, and basic uh, primitive of, of cryptography in general. But it also has very important ramifications to practice, because if we want to actually have secure computation be used uh, in reality, then maybe actually one of the biggest obstacles to adoption is the fact that we need everyone there at the same time, and that rarely happens. 
So this is important into practice, especially if it can be done efficiently, and that we'll talk about a bit later on. I just want to note, because you sort of seem to need to say that these days, fully homomorphic encryption doesn't solve the problem. Uh, you can think about it a bit, and you'll see why, because we just basically have to think about who owns the key. So our model is as follows. We have n parties, p1 through to pn, and we have, one, we have one server s, and each party interacts with the server once and exactly once. So you come, interact, and go away. In all of our protocols, that I'll talk, and, and one that I mention here, uh, this interaction is actually just retrieve something from the server and send it back. But as far as the model is concerned, we don't mind if you interact a few times. That doesn't matter. What's in, what is important is that uh, you carry out your computation on your input and then go away. You don't have to speak to anyone else. You don't have to worry about when the other parties are going to be online. At the end, the server obtains the output. The reason why only the server is obtaining output is because only the server is there to get the output. Obviously, if you wanted, you could have the server post that and you could come back later to get it, but you don't have to be there for the computation to take place. And we call the protocol for this setting one pass because all the parties just take, we just do one pass over all of the parties. Now this actually, uh, if you think about what this model means, it means that we have to compute what we call residual functions. So since the protocol is one pass, it means that the, the last n minus i parties, pi plus 1 through pn, and the server actually have to compute this residual function of the first i parties input. So parties, I don't know how you use the pointer on this thing like this, yeah. So the first uh, uh, i parties came and they gave their inputs, and then the last n minus i parties have to, comp have to give their inputs, but whatever their inputs are, the, these ones are already fixed. So we can actually look at this residual function. Why is this important? Because it means that if these par last n minus i parties and the server are all corrupted and colluding, then they can actually compute this residual function on many sets of final output, uh, inputs. And this is inherent to the model. This is not something that our protocol doesn't achieve. Any protocol which, is, which works in this model, this one pass model, has to have this problem because the legitimate last n minus i parties in server have to be able to compute on any set of their inputs. In particular, they can do this many times, but it's only, again, I want to stress, if the, both the server and these last n minus i parties are colluding, this could be one, two, three, four, depending on uh, what's the corruption uh, setting we have. So this le uh, leads us also to talk about something called function decomposition. So decomposition of a function is just really a, a series of n uh, two input functions, which is a series computing the final function. So you first compute f1 on the first input, then f2 on that result on the second input, and so on and so forth. In the end, you get the last, you get the final output. And in the one pass setting, it's again inherent to the model what's actually happening. PI and the server S, if they're interacting, are actually computing uh, the ith function FI in this decomposition series. And also what that means is that if the last n minus i parties and the server are all corrupted and colluding, then what they're learning is the output of that ith function in the decomposition. So decomposi function decomposition and these residual functions are inherent to this one pass model. And the question we have to ask ourselves, if it's inherent to the model, then what does it reveal if these last n minus i parties and the server are corrupted? Then what are they actually going to learn? And what we're going to say, what we define in the paper is that if it, this uh, uh, output of the i function reveals nothing more than that what the residual function gives, then we call it minimal disclosure. And that's because, as we said, the, the, the residual function is inherent to the model, and so we would like, if we have a decomposition that reveals only that, then that's the best that you can do, and so that's okay. Well, of course, it depends on the application. Let's just look at a couple of examples. You can be stupid and define your residual function, your, your decomposition in this way, that they're just identity functions. So f1 of x1 gives you x1, f2 gives you just the outputs of that, the, the inputs, and you essentially have all of the first n minus 1 functions giving you the uh, uh, identity functions, and the last one will compute it. So this just tells you that everything can be decomposed, but of course it's not interesting because if the last party and the server are both corrupted, then that's all you need and they get absolutely everything. So this is a very undesirable and stupid design. In contrast, let's look at this uh, decomposition for the sum function. It's just the partial sums until the ith input. Now, it's clear that if you're given the uh, output of the i function, you can get the sum of the first i, but that's all that you're getting. 
And indeed, this is minimal disclosure because you could get that anyway by just uh, having your, uh, by knowing your inputs. And in, even in the standard setting of a secure computation, any N minus I colluding parties can learn this information. So this is completely minimal disclosure. And what you can actually say is that all that is revealed by the ith uh, uh, function of decomposition is what would be the output if only those parties were computing. So this is optimal and, and uh, sufficient for many applications. So we define security by, in the standard way of secure computation, the ideal real paradigm. I won't go into it. It'll be discussed more tomorrow morning, I think. But all I want to stress is that in addition to what an adversary can usually do in the secure computation model, we allow it to get the output of the ith function, the decomposition, but only if both the server and the n minus i last parties are corrupted. If the server is honest, it gets absolutely nothing, just the standard definition of secure computation. And if the server is corrupted, then it just depends who the last party who came in the series, in this one pass series, is corrupted. And we call the protocol optimally private if it computes the decomposition, a, a decomposition that's a minimal disclosure. So I just want to stress one thing about the security definition. It talks about securely computing uh, a decomposition. So whatever decomposition you have for your function, the protocol should then compute to that level of uh, leakage which is modeled by the decomposition itself. You'd like optimally private, you don't always have. The main question I want to deal with the rest of my time is, can this notion be achieved? If yes, under what assumptions and at what cost? Because it sounds like something which is quite difficult. And in fact, uh, to at least to my surprise, we can do this really, really efficiently for a number of very uh, interesting problems. So let's talk, we'll, we'll talk in, in this talk, I'll focus on binary symmetric functions. These are functions with binary inputs 0, 1, and, but the output depends only on the Hamming weights. So if you think about and or parity or majority, which is our, again voting for tenure for our faculty member, then all we care about is how many people voted yes and how many people voted no. We don't care what the order of that is. So th these functions, binary symmetric functions, have a very concise truth table representation. So instead of a, for n inputs having a truth table of size 2 to the n, you actually have a truth table of size n plus 1. Why is that? Because you just look at the Hamming weight, and for each possible Hamming weight, you write each possible output, you write the output, and because uh, there are only n bits for input, there are n plus 1 possible Hamming weights, and the function only depends on the Hamming weight. So this is a complete description of the function. And this is the majority function. You can see if up to two parties uh, only have 1, then the output is 0, and, there, and otherwise the output is 1. So now I need to describe to you this decomposition into functions, and then uh, I'll show you how we can use that. So we're going to define y1, which is the f1 of x1, to be this complete truth table, but we're going to erase the first row if the first input is 1 and the last row if it's 0. So let's see that. If the first party, if the party has the input 1, then we know that the Hamming weight of the function cannot, the Hamming weight of the output cannot be 0, of all, of all the inputs, sorry, cannot be 0, because we already have a Hamming weight of 1 given by this bit. So we erase this row. On the other hand, if the first party's input is zero, then we erase the last row, because again, it means that the Hamming weight of all the inputs cannot be five, because we already have one zero. The second function is defined similarly. We take the truncated truth table, which we already got, and now we just erase the first or last row, depending on the party's input. So if the input is one, then again, we know we can't get the first row that's remaining, so we erase it. The third party uh, if it has one, then we again erase the first row. The fourth party has zero, so it's the last row. The last party has zero, so that's the, again, the last row. Each one just relates to the first or last row of the remaining table. And note the magic that indeed the majority of zero, one, one, zero, zero is zero, which is the only remaining row in the truth table. I just want to stress that we're not actually giving the Hamming weight. That would be too much. We're only looking at this. So this is this just erasing the first or last values of this table, which is the second column. So that says nothing about cryptography, about secure computation. This is just a decomposition, a way of, of uh, uh, dividing a function into a series of two, part, of two input functions along the way. This is actually a minimal disclosure because the truth table uh, at any given point only, show, only tells you the, it only enables you to compute, on, compute the residual function. Essentially, it's, there's nothing more disclosed than the aggregate of what was beforehand, or in other words, what you could compute given uh, your residual inputs. 
Now I want to show how to actually compute this uh, uh, very, very efficiently. The main tool is uh, layer randomizable encryption. So you can think about you have a number of uh, uh, keys and you encrypt the input under many, many keys and m different randomness, each party using different randomness. And we call it layer randomizable if you can actually just re-randomize all of the uh, um, random values in this sort of onion encrypted uh, uh, ciphertext. And I just want to say that you can do this with El Gamal really, really efficiently. It's the cost of a single encryption. You can decrypt threshold wise. You can re-randomize very, very efficiently. So this is actually not difficult to do. And all, I just want to note that all our protocols assume a PKI. It's essential for the model, but you can see the paper for more details. In the semi-honest model, our protocol works as follows. The server uh, starts by encrypting the entire truth table un under all the party's keys and it uses re-randomizable layer encryption. Then each party, uh, again it's a one-pass protocol, so each party comes, talks to the server and goes away. So each party comes, takes the truth table that remains from the server and erases either the first or last row depending on what its input is, which already said, showed how that works. But you can do the oblivious, you don't have to know what was already done beforehand and that's the beauty of the decomposition. So I just get back what's remaining of the truth table, erase the first or the last row, now I peel off my secret key, so I decrypt under my secret key, and re-randomize everything that's there. At the end, all that remains is a single row, which, the server, uh, which is encrypted under the server's public key, and the server then decrypts that and gets the result. So let's just look at that graphically. Here's our table. What it means is the server encrypts this table, or the value 000111, under the six public keys, five public keys of the parties who are participating, and its own public key is the sixth one. The first party gets this truth table all encrypted and has input of zero, so it erases the last row, the last element, the last ciphertext. Then it removes its key and re-randomizes. So you can see now that it's uh, the public keys from two to six rather than from one to six. The second party has input one, it erases the first row, again now removes its key, so now we go from PK three to six and re-randomizes and we continue P3 again erases the first input because it had x3 equals 1, re removes the key, re-randomizes. P4 has 0, so it erases the last. And we're left now with these two values encrypted under PK5 and PK6. And what this means is that if, the, if PK5, if party, it's a fifth party is corrupted and colluding with the server, then they're able to actually get these two values. But all that means is that they know that the first four, four parties were evenly divided. They don't know anything else beyond that. And in fact, they would even know this if it was a regular secure computation set, scenario. So this is actually uh, optimal and uh, uh, nothing is lost in, in, in any, in, in at least most applications or any that I can think of. The security of this protocol is that uh, follows from the fact that if the server is honest, then no one learns anything because everything the, the entire time is encrypted under the server's pub public key. But even if the server is corrupted, as long as the truth table is encrypted under at least one of the honest party's keys, nothing is learned. And the re-randomization prevents from making any connections between what was erased uh, the first or the last row along the way. And so that, that means is until the last honest party comes, nothing is learned. Once the last honest party has come and the remaining parties are all corrupted, then as we said, this is inherent to the model, that they can then see what remains, but that's as if we just computed on the subset of parties, which is uh, uh, actually okay. The concrete cost of this is three and over two exponentiations for n parties, and since we can do even probably 3,000 exponentiations per second if we uh, uh, um, have good software, then uh, this can be practical even for thousands of users. The only problem can be 500 come at the same time and they actually have to wait for each other. But, but uh, at least for uh, uh, many of our uh, um, uh, uh, real uh, scenarios like the tenure of votes or others, this is definitely practical. For malicious adversaries, and I won't go into exactly how, we can actually also do this efficiently using the Fiat Shamir paradigm to uh, help us get really efficient zero knowledge proofs. And our estimate is that for about 40 parties, it should take 10 seconds computation per party. So this is really something which is practical and can be used for uh, uh, something like voting that we talked about. And in the paper, we actually have highly efficient protocols for other problems as well. And in addition, an important result, since we're studying this also from a theoretical point of view, is that we prove that in fact any decomposition can be securely uh, computed under 
in, in this one-pass model. And that's an important general feasibility result saying that this one-pass model actually has a lot of applicability and it, this is our result is under the DDH assumption and if you uh, need from and for malicious adversary you also need non-interactive zero knowledge. And this works for any decomposition, so if it's minimal disclosure, then that's the best you can get. That, but otherwise, it depends on the application, whether your decomposition is good enough, and that's part of your uh, design for your application. So in summary, fully interactive secure computation is actually a problem in practice. And in many cases, we need what we call a one-pass client-server protocol. In addition to this being of interest from a practical perspective, it's also interesting from a theoretical point of view to understand what communication is needed for secure computation. We introduced this model and defined security for it. We also studied inherent limitations and we used and introduced this notion of function decomposition and residual computation and, and minimal disclosure in order to understand this. And then we constructed highly efficient protocols for this setting and showed that for many natural problems actually we have uh, we can really do this in practice. And we also proved the general feasibility result showing that uh, we can solve any protocol problem, at least within the inherent limitations of the model. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, again, we don't have time for questions.